No, I completely agree with John, and it's one of the, the jobs um, through my life is, has been sort of connected to birthdays. I remember at school, uh, when I was teaching, there could be people, sorry, um, there could be people who'd arrive at school and, um, and nobody would ever know it was their birthday, and they'd go home, and nobody would have wished them happy birthday at all, and then there were others, obviously, who were, yeah, it's my birthday, I'm so happy, and um, and so what me and the head teacher used to do, I used to make a, make sure I checked each week whose birthday it was, and I used to write it on the board, happy birthday, da 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 and it just meant that everybody could come and say, oh, is it your birthday? Oh, great, you know, and we used to get them a card, and and even now, um, in the role I've got now, it's one of the jobs that I do is to check the birthdays and go and visit people. And um, and honestly, some of the responses you get when you, you walk up and uh, and just say, um, oh, it's your birthday, happy birthday. And people are so moved. I mean, the other day I, I came up to somebody I'd never met before and I just said, oh, you know, I sort of sought this person out and just said, um, oh, I hear it's your birthday, happy birthday. And, um, and he's just sort of, and he went to give me a hug, and they suddenly realized that, you know, oh, he doesn't know me. But just that somebody said, happy birthday, I'm valuable, I'm valuable in this world. And I completely agree, John, I think that's really, really important. Um, this morning, I mean, well, every day, really, you sort of wake up and you feel as though sometimes you could pinch yourself. When I look at um, the life that, that, that the world brings and the sorrow and the heartache and the trouble, um, sometimes I feel overwhelmed. I genuinely do. And my heart feels as if it's just going to break. And I think because I can see the, the, the effect that the world has on lives and it just wrecks them. And, I've, and I'm always thinking, Lord, why did, you know, why did I hear about you? You know, how did it happen? You know, why were you so good to me? Why have you walked through life with me? You know, from, 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 you know, being, you know, 1920. Um, and it's, it's just been amazing. It just absolutely blows me away. And I am so grateful to God. I am so grateful to God. And, um, <clears throat> And I was thinking this morning about um, children, and, um, and 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 I remember when I when I when I was at school because I, I taught just little youngsters, you know, only um, infant um, age children, but they used to have such a faith. It was amazing, and they'd come with their prayers, and you know, and and, and I remember I'd get sort of like a little line, and they'd come out and they and they'd pray, and they believed that God would answer. They knew that he was real, and they loved, they absolutely loved our little um, times together in the morning in, in, in the classroom. And, you know, it was very, very precious. And I think it's interesting that when people get to their teens and their sort of late teens or early 20s, I think that is a time when people are really ripe to hear the gospel because you've left your childhood where you felt completely secure and, and, and you've and you have an awareness, and I had an awareness of God when I was a child, even though I wasn't in a Christian family. And suddenly you see the world and what it has to offer. And it isn't bright and, and, and all lights flashing. It might look like that, but when you're actually in it, it's dark and it's hard. And, and, you, and you get disillusioned and disappointed by people. And I do think there's a time when people are ripe to the gospel. Because after that, what can happen? People can become settled with the lot that they get in life. And they just become settled and think, well, this is my lot in life. I've just got to grin and bear it and get on with it. I might not like it, but I've just got to get on with it. And But God's got so much more, so much more for our communities and for our families. And... Um, and yeah, and and the, and the days I feel of um, of people really coming to faith that they're here, they are here. People are hungry for an answer. They need an answer. You know, it's been saying costs are going up, all sorts of things are happening, and people need an answer. And we think people aren't interested. They are. They are interested. 
as long as we link it to, you know, to, to their lives and what Jesus can do in their lives for them. So um, the, 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 the title um, this morning is, I put a new start. And um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know whether you're like me, but sometimes I can go through times when I feel like every day I need a new start. I made a right messy yesterday. Not, not this yesterday. But you know what I mean? You think, oh, why did I do that? And I went down there, I shouldn't have done that. And oh, how did I get into that mess? And, but, but God is a God of new starts. We look at people like David. We look at people like Peter. And they needed new starts. And we do too. And so this morning, I'm going to be looking at new starts. I'm going to have a look at adoption. And you'll see why, because it links to the um, account that I'm uh, looking at. Um, I'm going to be looking at the account of Moses' birth. Okay. Um, and about the new start he got when he was um, saved from death and went and he was adopted into um, the family and became Pharaoh's, the daughter, the, he became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And I'm going to also be looking at what it means for us to be adopted into God's family. So the first thing I did uh, before um, I got, you know, sort of felt to, to look at the scripture, I thought, oh, I'll have a quick look and see why are children adopted? I thought, why? What, 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 what would it say? And it said, most children who need adoptive families have been removed from their birth families by the courts because their parents and wider family were unable to provide the care that they need. And if ever we see people in life needing to be adopted into God's family, you know, it's just there before us, isn't it? Just, just like those children. And, um, and it's interesting that it's always children who are adopted. You know, sometimes I think, oh, it could do with a few adults being adopted. They could do with some help. And they would agree. They would completely agree. You know, they've been brought up with a family that was, you know, didn't know what to do. And then the next generation didn't know what to do. And each one gets a bit worse. And sometimes it feels like there's no way out. But it isn't. It's children who are adopted. And, and we've got to come as children. When we are adopted into God's family, we have to come as children, trusting him and accepting of his help and his love and his kindness. Right, I'm going to look at um, the account in um, Exodus 2. Uh, before I do, I'm sure most of you know, but I'll just give a very quick uh, bit of history. So we had Joseph, who, um, terrible circumstances, but ended up in Egypt and he interpreted uh, Pharaoh's dream of seven years of famine. I mean, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh uh, put Joseph in charge, and um, that's exactly what happened. And they stored up lots of food so that when there was a seven years of famine, everybody was fed. But years go by, and isn't it funny how quickly people forget? They really do. We're all like that. We forget things. And, um, and so another king came along and he looked around and he could see that the children of Israel had become very numerous. There was loads of them and they were being very much blessed by God. And he was worried and he thought, well, if, if we suddenly get, get in a war and these people decide to sort of join forces with the enemy, we could be in real trouble here. So he decided to uh, subject them to slavery. But, it, but, but no matter how much he, he sort of put the burdens on and made it harder for the people of Israel. They just seemed to grow, in, grow and grow in number. And so eventually he, he decided that um, what probably the best idea was that when a Hebrew woman had a child, if it was a girl, it could live. But if it was a boy, well, then um, it had to be killed and um, it to be, it, the child was to be thrown into the Nile and that's where we're catching up with the story. So it's Exodus 2, and I'm just going to read verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a, a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar, and pitch, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. 
Now, I feel as though I can really relate to um, Amram, um, Moses' mother, and I'm sure every woman, if, if you've had a child here, can do that. Because I think of all the things in, in life, one of the most amazing, amazing moments that I'll never forget um, it is the birth of a child. There is just nothing like it. Your first child it is just such a miracle, an absolute miracle. And I can remember with, uh, with our Joe, um, I hadn't been terribly well with it. Well, I'd been well in myself, but things hadn't been going according to plan. And I had to spend quite a few weeks um, in the hospital. And I remember when I was there, that if anybody came to visit me, I was desperate to see them, desperate to see them. I didn't want them to go. And I'd go walk to the, down the corridor and go to the window at the end and give them a wave. And I was so miserable, I was so, so miserable. And I remember when they let me out for a day on my birthday and, you know, it was just lovely to be home. And the next day I came back and I just cried and cried and cried because I just wanted to be with my family. But as soon as Joe was born, everything changed. I wasn't bothered if nobody came to see me. I couldn't take my eyes off this miracle of birth. He was perfect. And everything about him, I just, I was absolutely transfixed on him. I just couldn't take my eyes off him. And, and, and the rest of the time I spent in there, then you had to spend about a week in with your first child. They showed you how to bath them one thing and another. And, um, and I loved it. I loved being there because I had this most precious bundle of joy. And, you know, I can imagine when Moses was born, that, that great delight to have that child. And, and she looked after him and kept him hidden for three months. But then, suddenly, with all of the best intentions in the world, with all of uh, everything she would have wanted, she couldn't, she couldn't um, look after him. She couldn't keep him safe. Like we read about adoption earlier, this mother could not keep her child safe. And, um, you know, I remember... Um, looking after some uh, little girls when um, their mother was just going through a, a difficult patch and um, we looked after the little girls. And I remember talking to the mother and you know what, I realized that she loved those children, that she cared for them deeply, but she couldn't look after them. Her life was in crisis at that time. She, you know, everything was going wrong and she absolutely, with the best intentions, she couldn't, she knew that she couldn't look after those children but she loved them she really loved them and um and this is where Amram is really she's just in that situation and sometimes with our families we go through times where we feel that things are going uh, wrong and that with our very best intentions and with everything that we can do we can't we can't help them we can't meet their needs we can't be there for them you know when when the babies and things, we feel as though we can do everything for them. But when people get older, you suddenly realize that you can't. You can't live somebody else's life. You can't help them the way that you want to. But we've got, a, we've got somebody who can. And when um, everything is going completely wrong and we can't do anything, that's when God steps in. And I want to read the next part of um, this account now. And this is, um, um, here we are. Let me just have a look. Yeah, yeah, we'll read, that. We'll read the next account. And it's um, Exodus 2, 5 to 10. And it says, And Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. And she opened it and saw the baby and he was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, um, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the baby and nurse him for me and I'll pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him and when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So Amram had um, 
you know, when, when she'd had uh, Moses for three months, she'd put him in the papyrus basket, she'd put tar on, and she, all she could do was leave him. She'd put him in the reed, she'd, she, she left him, and I thought it was quite interesting that it was Miriam, he said it was Moses' sister, who was stood there watching, it wasn't the mum, and I thought, I, I understand that, because if something goes wrong, you don't want to see um, something horrible happening to your child. You don't want to see that. And she left, um, and she left Miriam um, there. And yeah, yeah. And, it, uh, and I'll read this scripture from Isaiah 49, 13 to 16. And again, this sort of perhaps gives a, a bit of a picture. It says here, shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. What a wonderful promise. What a fantastic promise. But it's interesting that even though God has said that, he said, but Zion says, his people say, this is what they said after hearing that, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And God replies with, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hand, and your walls are ever before me. And sometimes we feel, you know, we know that God hasn't forgotten us. We know the word, we know all about it. But then deep inside we think, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten my situation? Have you forgotten the people that I love? Where are you? But God hasn't, he hasn't. And as we've just read here about what happened next, we can see that God had not forgotten. He hadn't forgotten um, Moses. He hadn't forgotten Amram. And it's interesting that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, when you look at this, it just speaks of coincidence, doesn't it? You're thinking, wow, how did that happen? You know, just at the moment, you know, just at the time where they put hidden the basket, Pharaoh's daughter comes by ready to bathe, what are the chances of a basket well hidden being found? You know, what are the chances of all of that happening? And, and that's what happens with God. Sometimes, you know, when everything's going wrong and we can't do anything and we allow God into that situation, then what seems like coincidences start to happen. God begins to work in ways that we can never begin to imagine. And so sometimes being in a desperate situation where things are going wrong can be a positive uh, because that's when God um, can take over. Um, yeah. And so here we see anyway, um, Pharaoh's daughter, she looked at him, she, she felt sorry for him, she loved him. And and what, what were the chances of her, you know, going to the, the mother and um, paying her to do the very thing she wanted to do to, you know, just to nurse that child? But that's what happened. You know, she got to nurse her child. She even got paid for it. And Moses was protected. We, by being adopted into that family, he was protected. And he learned all sorts of skills because God had plans for him in the future to free Israel from the slavery they'd been in um, for, for, for over a hundred years, it's said. Sorry, I've lost my place. I'm, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to just go back. I'm ever so sorry. My, my brain's gone. Um, my brain's gone a little bit dead, but never mind. Um, but but when I when I when I go back to um, you know the, the beginning of when I when I first knew Christ, I can remember um, just that lovely feeling of the weight being lifted, and you just knew that you could trust, trust God with everything, everything in life. You just knew you're going to go through some valleys. You knew you're going to go through some deserts. But there was that knowing inside that no matter what happens, God's going to be there. Um, but just as, um, you know, children um, who, who, who are, are removed from their families, um, I know that when I've spoken to people connected with that, the, the, 
well, all the children I've, I've ever spoken to would always, if they were given a choice, would want to go straight back to their families, even though, um, you know, it might mean all sorts of difficulties for them, you know, and, and being in a situation where they can't, couldn't be cared for, their desire would always, always be to go back to the families. And that's what Moses did. He, he went back to see how his people were doing and... Um, and, and then he realized that, um, you know, life was hard for them and he ended up killing um, an Egyptian and he thought that they would understand that God had sent him, but, but they hadn't. Um, it says in Exodus 2, 11, it said, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian, and he hid him in the sand. Um, you know, and sometimes we feel we, we can have the temptation to go back into what we had before, into our old lives. Um, you know, going back to taking on burdens, going back to taking on worries, going back to taking on doubts, going back to trying to take the reins of our own lives and, and go things our own way instead of God's way. And, 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 and for Moses, God really wanted him to, um, you know, he wanted to use him, but he wanted to do it his way. He wanted to, um, he wanted to do his work through Moses, but it took a long time for Moses to get to that point. Right, I'm just, I'm just going to move on now, just to say that... Um, you know, God, God, God loves us, and He promises, He promises us all the, the things we need for life. And I've just put down a few scriptures here, and I'm not going to read them all, but we've, we just need to go, just need to rest on the promises that He's got, and not let things get in the way and clutter and things like that—the things that would draw us back into an old way of life. And He promises to give us strength. And in Ephesians 3:16-17. He says, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And so when we're tempted to worry and be fearful, we just need to just rely on his strength. He promises to give us rest, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And God wants, he wants us to sleep at night. He wants us to have rest. He wants us to have peace. And that's what he's promised us. And he promises to care for our needs, Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And as somebody said was it this morning that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. To answer our prayers, ask and it will be given you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you. To work everything out for our good, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have called according to his purpose, God will work everything out for your good. I don't know what people are going through this morning. I don't know your situations. You don't know mine. But God has got good. He has got good. He is going to help us. He is going to work things out. Without a shadow of a doubt, he will work it out. He promises to be with us. Joshua 1, 5 and verse 9. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He promises to protect us. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust even though we don't always feel that we can trust. He is there. This is his promises to us. And at difficult times, we need to fill our lives with his promises. 
And remember that nothing can separate us from him. Romans 8, 38, 39. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves us. He loves us. He loves you. You are precious to him. You really, really are. And Moses experienced so many new starts, even in this small account, you know, he was due to be killed. He got a new start. He was adopted. He was protected. And then he ended up killing somebody. But he got a new start. It was in, a, in the wilderness. But again, he was there. He got a new start when God spoke to him through the burning bush. It was, you know, you can see God's hand right throughout his life. And I think this morning God want, wants to, um, us to draw near to him. He wants us to trust him when everything around us seems hopeless to embrace his promises and by faith make them part of our lives when our lives seem impossible. And he wants to give us a new start and to move us on from where we are to be closer to him, to learn from him and to follow his leading. And as I said earlier, each day can be a new start. You know, when, we, when our lives mirror God's and we're more like him, and that we can live victorious lives because we have the message that we have. We've we, we've got to, um, be, we've got to be changed to be like God. We've got to because this world is crying out for some answers. It is crying out for answers. We've got the answers. <coughs> and you know what? Life is not about me. It's not about me. And I've got and I've got to be in a place where I, I can show. You know, I can show from what comes out that God has the answers. He brings about coincidences. They are not coincidences. He brings about his purposes. But we have got to believe. We've got to claim those promises. We've got to stand on those promises. We've got to decide that we're going to follow him. We've got to decide that we're going to leave some of the rubbish behind. Some of the, even some of the things we do with our time, he's saying... Let's be people of this moment. Let's be people for now. Let's just, let's make a difference in our locality because we can and people need to hear. I came to faith because somebody spoke. They told me. They showed me. But they told me. I know loads of good people. There are loads of good people around. But but, but being good in itself cannot give any answers to anybody else's life. You can say, I want to be like you. You've got a good life. Everything's good for you. But that's not me. But God says, I've got good for you. I've got good for each one of you. So, you know, let's make the last years of our lives count. Let's be God's mouthpiece like he, he worked through Moses. Um, to bring the people of Israel out of slavery. Let us be people that God says, here is somebody who trusts me, somebody who stands on my promises. I'm going to work through them. I'm going to bring about my plans. This world is dying. and We need to get people onto God's lifeboat because this, this world's only short. It's only a tiny, tiny thing. Eternity's forever.